you where we're going, um, how we're going to get there, and uh, I hope you've been experiencing some of the different digital things from the exhibits out there and uh, looking at uh, digital through time in different aspects depending what area of space you're in. And we're really excited about uh, some of the positive feedback that's coming out. I hope the rain doesn't keep um, people away. We do have other people who are registered and have paid and they're not here yet. So um, hopefully it's not a rain issue and they'll show up. And the only good thing is maybe it'll rain early enough and we can still have our concert tomorrow night at uh, City yeah, Hall. Yeah, so yeah. so it'll be out of the system and we'll be moving on. Uh, but I'm going to give you a little bit of information about JDS, Creative Academy, and what we have going on here. Uh, I know some of you have been here, so you've kind of heard some of <laughs> And I was just a nut for it. And luckily, when I was a kid, my mom, boyfriend, climbed a telephone pole and basically messed with the wires, and we had free cable. For all the <laughs> and this is early 80s, so cable television, we didn't have a lot of, uh, it was a lot of programming on there. You know, they didn't have Game of Thrones, you know? So HBO was playing, you know, they play Star Wars, but they'd also play the making of Star Wars. Disney Channel, you know, they show all their old cartoons, but they'd also show all of the Walt Disney specials where he's like, this is how we make cartoons. I never missed an episode. <laughs> I was drawing it every day. How did they do this? How did they do this? Some of the first digital technology from Star Wars is that they programmed a camera to go over the, the, the big model of the Death Star trench run. They programmed a camera they, they have what's basically that every computer has. Is you usually have a lot of math. You have X, Y, Z coordinates. It's a Cartesian coordinate system by Rene Descartes. Came from Renaissance. So they program the coordinates for the camera to move, and the camera moves and see Death Star, explosions, everything's timed out. All I have is some guy in a box just putting buttons in. Mm -hmm. Digital. Yeah. The first 2D digital, there's a, new, there's a new show on HBO called Westworld. Mm -hmm. 1973, Bill Brenner was in the original film. Oh, yeah. When they show his point of view, when he's looking at, you see that kind of digital look? That, that's the first 2D digital animation. The version of 1973. So as far as me, as I kept going through, going to school, um, I was an architect explorer. I started learning architecture, because I had naive parents and a bad high school guidance counselor. <laughs> <laughs> so I was doing, uh, Nights at an architecture firm, and we had this computer aided drafting and design. It's a digital how to do blueprints for houses. I thought it was cool to do a computer, but like I couldn't play games on it, I couldn't tell stories, <laughs> but I could tell you where the doors and the toilets go in the house. <laughs> and I was like, all right, you know, get into that. So, 1993, I graduated high school, another film comes out, Jurassic Park. <laughs> That blew me away. I was like, you mean you could actually make photo real characters? You know, when we look at it now, it's kind of like, yeah, that's kind of old. But uh, that blew me away, and I was like, well, I'm going to go to school for that. And I started going to junior college, Mount San Antonio College in Walnut. And there I met a lot of people who actually worked part time as instructors in the animation industry. So I just picked their brains every day. Then they started a digital animation program at Mount Sac because another film came out, Toy Story. And I was like, I gotta learn how to do this stuff. And I found out that during the program, I like to draw too much because the uh, Toy Story and Pixar 3D animation, it's puppets in a computer that you can just keyframe. And I was like, oh, I want to do the drawing stuff, I want Latin. <laughs> so I started Looking for ways to do that, I started taking classes at a place called the Animation Academy in Burbank. It's run by a really say, passionate man named Charles Villas. And this guy, <laughs> I call him the warlord, because he could take bad artists, make them good, make good artists great, and great artists amazing. And 
I was lucky enough to work with uh, a lot of industry guys, uh, Jose Lopez, Stephen Silver, Tom Perkins. These are all character designers in the industry. Steve Silver designed Kim Possible, uh, Danny Fan, you know, Nickelodeon shows. Uh, Jose Lopez is the uh, art director for the latest Transformers cartoons. Tom Perkins worked on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and there was a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles anime movie called TMNT. His character designer on that, so I got to basically pop around with these guys. And another guy, John Navarro, is a storyboard artist at Pixar. Um, Kelsey Mann, who's head of story at Pixar, was a student. When I was a student, <laughs> so I surrounded myself with some really good people. Then I uh, decided I want to get my degree and finish, so I went to Woodbury University. And I'm going to show you something that's really kind of embarrassing to me, but it is my first film from college. And it's called Penguins Don't Fly. It's about five minutes long. It's done, all the animation is done digitally. The backgrounds were painted by hand in watercolor. Now we basically did traditional, digital, put them together. So let's back to pull that up.
flush them out and actually make them a little cleaner and actually animatable because he was a very rough ink or rough sketches so getting a lot of that detail it doesn't really work for animation so you need to get it simplified and streamlined so I take his drawings kind of tone them down but still keep the, the essence of what he's going for and then get them all digitized and then I would put in their eye blinks their mouth charts and that was handed to the animators to put in the scenes and make them act. I did a lot of that basic character design work for about half my career was doing mouth charts, eye blinks, <laughs> head turns, character design work. Um, the last about six years I've moved more into animating. I worked at a game company where it was great because I got to, to be a lead artist. I had to uh, create games. It was a, uh, a game I could pull up on a Scholastic that I pulled up last night. I was the only artist to work on it, so I got to do everything. And so I got to, uh, it was just me, a producer, and a programmer. I made a baseball game and a football game. And they just let me go, do whatever you want. I'm like, all right. So <laughs> I could pull those up. mouth charts and eye blinks and stuff. Mm -hmm. I remember when I then you were talking about just a walking, just creating little bits of someone walking and then you mm -hmm. can resell that to other studios or um not necessarily because usually a studio will have a project in mind and they'll have like their character and you say you create a walk so like you now can you reuse it for the same show? Yeah. Um in digital work, there's uh, sometimes you find a show that looks just like a show you used to work on, even though you're at a different studio. So you could, you know, reuse uh, drawings of hands that you did five years ago. Hmm, so they're so, not copyrighted by the studio then? No, because if you drew them, it's yours. Yeah, but you if you work for a company, whatever you create for that company yeah. is theirs. Trust me, they, they don't notice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they probably wouldn't notice, but do you have to sign non-disclosure agreements? Oh, yeah, every, 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 every show, yeah, there? but the thing is, they're, you know, if you're going to draw one hand that's for a whole character, I mean, it, it, when you were talking about drawing a hand, it looks the same, so why are you going to invent the wheel? Right. So it's, like, I can draw the same hand over and over in my head, but it's like, I just have a library of these. Right. Plug and play. It, it's a good way to streamline and make things faster, but 99% of the time, I just redraw the hand. Because <laughs> I've seen uh, places where we do more like puppety flash shows like uh, Metalocalypse, which was a uh, adult <coughs> show. Um, they had hand packs, so they have like, all these kinds of hands, so the animator can go in and go, I want this pose or that pose in a certain frame. And I watch the animators. Scrubbing through this whole pack of hands that are like a hundred drawings of hands, looking for the just the exact right one. And I'm like, you're gonna take 20 minutes to do that when it could take you five seconds, five minutes to draw it. Right. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This is a game I made for Scholastic, but I can't do it because this doesn't have flash play. So in general, you're not really working for one company for your no, entire career. You're no, like, you're, no, you're, you're, you're going to project to project. Project to project. And so are you your own company? Sometimes. Yeah. yeah right now, I'm like, sitting on the Lady and the Tiger. Mm -hmm. I'm an independent contractor, so I'm my own business. Mm -hmm. uh, on Son of Zorn, I was full-time employee. So that would lead to the hurt question about at what level does something become copyrightable? Um, usually, like like Lake and the Tiger, somebody else already owns it, and they're just you know I'm work for hire. Now if it's something I created, you know, send it to the copyright office, go to writers guild, get it protected. Yeah, this is my game. 
<laughs> cool thing, if you can like, send in links to that, you can play the game and you can uh, hit home runs into the windows, the windows break, you get fireworks, everything was done in there. Uh, even the UI, which is all like the, how many players you have left and what the score is, and all these, all those little things have to be designed and drawn. And, yeah. Man, you get really bored doing that because you just want to animate the character hitting home runs. He did uh, the Lord of the Rings cartoons in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, did a film called Cool World. Right now, he, I think he just finished up a film called Last Days of Coney Island. And he's amazed because his whole studio was a computer. He had like four or five guys animating in his house. Digital, ink, paint, everything was done. He's like, I have no lab fees. I don't have to send this out to anybody. I don't have to worry about painting cells. This is, you know, he's amazing. And if you want to be an animator, get yourself a computer. <laughs> Draw every day. Put it in. Make your own film. Sell it to HBO. You know, eat a cup of noodles for a year. <laughs> Next thing you know, you got a film. Send it out there. Sell to Netflix. <laughs> That's what I want to do. <laughs> um, before you move on to the next film, what would you say to like some of the parents, because uh, I know some people think certain uh, animation is yeah, not suitable for them. You're going to not make it. Um, you know, they're, they're, if you have a passion for something, you're gonna, the money will find you. I wouldn't even really worry about it. Uh, I was lucky. Um, my parents were a little naive, they didn't know. They're like, he wants to be an artist. So let him do his thing. So, but once you get going, the next, the real trick is just getting yourself in front of the, the right people. Getting yourself, surrounding yourself with good people. But when you went to school in, you said Burbank, mm -hmm. that's really what got you in front of and made those connections in the industry. And that yeah. came up too. Yeah, well, actually, it, it, Mount San Antonio College, <coughs> Atlanta, so yeah. back in Atlanta, they had a lot of people that were, uh, had been in the industry that were teaching them. Okay. Those are the first ones. So that really was your first connection. Yeah. Then I started taking classes at the Animation Academy in Burbank. And that was a school that was the students were all professionals just wanting to hone their skills. So I met there. You can go to the Animation Guild. They have classes there. You will meet people who work in the industry there. And it's just networking. Is, is there like, um, this might sound silly, a website for the industry that you could go to to post like resumes and that sort of thing? Um, you know, I, I've never... Because I know, I t I'm a teacher at the university, be, and they have, a lot of, um, they have higher-ed.com, yeah. and that's where we go and post our resumes, so I didn't know if you had the same thing for your industry. You no, know, I think, you know, all the studios, they just, you know, you send your stuff to every studio. Individually. I, you know, I mean, you'll find... Uh, AWN, Animation World Network, um, uh, what's the... Cartoon Brew. Cartoon Brew, uh, that's what I was looking for. Um, you can find, we used to have a website called Cold Hard Flash. It was basically Flash Animator. Uh, Aaron Simpson, I don't think he really runs that. He hasn't posted much on it lately. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there are places you can go. But the main thing is, is getting yourself out. It's, it's a lot of self-marketing. We can get a YouTube channel. And what about trade magazines? I know, like, I used to work in fashion, so we had trade magazines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Magazine magazine. Magazine too? Yeah, yeah. They used to be kind of like an industry ride for a while. Like, it was all like, oh, look at what this next corporate executive is doing. And we're like, they didn't even interview any of the artists? And then a lot of people started banging on the door, and they started... Uh, getting more artists to interview and do different things. Uh, honestly, I haven't picked up that magazine in a long time. But, it, but it, that's probably a good starting point for people trying to get in, newbies trying to get into the yeah. industry. I'll leave no, business cards. I got to watch. Mm. <laughs> Just send me your stuff. Well, I don't know. I'm thinking about this side. Yeah. Good.
No, no, they, the game was already a popular game, right. and it's owned by Disney. And Disney hired a studio that I was working at and said, hey, we want to make cartoons out of you this game. <coughs> so we actually had to take the, the, the simple designs that they had in the game that were not so great. We, we, we kind of leveled them up, yeah. so to speak, every day. And downstairs, in the bottom of the building, they knew when he was coming in, and one of the animators downstairs would see that, and he had a button. He hit, hit, hit the button, and a little red light would come on on the third, third floor where Chuck Jones and his story team was going. So they knew, oh, the producer's coming. So before the producer comes in, they would all get in different positions. One would be tying the shoe, and one would be, well, I'm just working on it over here. And another person would be doing something over here. Oh man, would look in and be like, all right, you guys are working. Yeah, yeah, we're good. We had to leave. Comes back at the end of the day, and we're downstairs to see Leon coming in and hit that button. Chuck Jones and all the staff get in the same positions they were, but all the work would be done. This guy never knew how anything ever was made. <laughs> the same studio that uh, there's an animator who got busted. And this was in the 50s. And he had a, a downstairs uh, office window, and he would climb out his window and go to the bar across the street, <laughs> get a drink, comes back, and he's climbing back through the window, and the producer catches him. And he's like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I was saving time by going through the window. I didn't want to walk all the way around. He goes, oh, good job. 